So James, uh, great to have you on. Um, kind of take us back to why you started Post Hog, what the reason was, and kind of, um, you know, what your idea was here. Sure. So uh, Tim, my co-founder, and I were uh, going through Y Combinator. We were working on a different idea at the time, and we just got incredibly fed up as technical people trying to implement product analytics. We, to the extent where we just couldn't help ourselves, but to do some, go do something about it. We wanted to help product managers and engineers to collaborate with each other um, rather than product analytics just being built for product manager, which an engineer would have to go implement. There's a number of competitors here. Like talk, talk to me about, you know, kind of like the competitors and, you know, why, why would you choose to do this new startup here when there are so many other companies in this, in this space? The thing that about us is fundamentally different is we think about engineering first. We're completely developer focused at this stage of our life. We pick up a bunch of product managers along the way. We just believe that the very best companies from all our user interviews, like when we launched our project, I used to go buy coffee for everyone who starred our repo on GitHub. Um, and I would try and understand a bit about like how engineers think about the impact of the work, of their work and their understanding of user behavior and the impact that their pull requests were having on their user interface. It was really clear to us that the companies that had grown to be massive and had seen hyper growth, so kind of Facebook, Netflix, Pinterest, those kinds of places, there's a there's a culture in engineering where engineers have much, they're much closer to their user data. They really understand um, what users are doing in their products and they have a lot more autonomy and empowerment to make decisions alongside a product manager rather than sort of just building what they're told to as a dictatorship, basically. Um, we believe that what we're going to be able to do is get engineers to want to install product analytics um, for, to kind of bring a lot of this data into their daily working environment too. Um, ultimately, the end goal is to help every engineer in the world understand the impact of their work so there are more successful products in the world. Like, how do you think about hiring going forward, especially like, you know, in, in times like this? Yeah, so hiring is utterly crucial to us at this stage where a little mantra internally is we put kind of team and employees first, actually over customers, what that means is an input that we can control. We can create, make this a great place to work. We can pay people really well. Um, we can create a culture of very direct feedback. We treat it very much as a team, not as a family. Um, and people here are just putting out the best work of their lives. Off the back of that, we're getting a ton of user growth, um, which is what we can then use to say, hey, let's like keep speeding this thing up. Let's keep raising investment and growing faster and faster. And that's worked really well for us so far. And it's kind of why uh, like working with GV was a great example of we saw this opportunity to kind of go up into the next gear. We raised a lot of ambition in the company and it really just, everything started moving more quickly. You know, one question I have for you, uh, and I think a lot of companies have this early on is, um, you know, so, you know, when you get started, you kind of just build and, and you're building, not necessarily thinking about the underlying architecture and what needs to happen. Uh, yeah. And, but then, but then you reach a point where it matters, right? Where, you got to think about what's the right database on the back end. What's the right infrastructure on the back end? Maybe talk to me a, a bit about kind of how you thought about that and uh, and where you are where you are today with that. We optimized for speed when we built the product. The thing we launched initially was only a four week old project um, with no users, nothing at all on GitHub in the world. So we kind of spent January through February just working night and day to get something out the door and um, to kind of validate the concept. Like, our engineers going to install this thing? Are they going to care about their user behavior? The architecture we used. Um, was, I guess we optimized for boring. <laughs> like we picked tools and frameworks that we'd used before. We, you know, from a technical perspective, that meant kind of Django backend, React frontend, Postgres underneath. Super, super simplistic, but that was what allows us to build as quickly as possible. We're big on iteration. Ongoingly, we will always launch features, um, kind of slightly embarrassingly early, um, because what that does with open source, we can get them into people's hands really, really quickly. We get way more feedback than we'd get doing kind of traditional SaaS. Um, and it allows us to kind of iterate where we see kind of demand. We took that approach with the whole uh, repo to start off with. Um, we then had, we got swamped um, with people sending literally billions of events to us. So we've just been through a major, uh, we've just completed a major kind of refactoring where we've now got support for, uh, for ClickHouse as a database underneath. That's allowing us to serve kind of individual customers who have hundreds of millions of monthly visitors. But going forward, now that you have made this transition, how do you think about future proofing the tech on the back end? Architecture wise, we have quite a broad approach to products. Like we're genuinely building a platform versus kind of a thin slice. What that's enabling us to do is give a huge amount of autonomy to the engineers 
uh, that we have on our team and they'll take they'll decide which part of the product they're going to work on they might do things like um the person we have session recordings a feature it lets you watch video replays of your users this is something that i actually thought was a bad idea to build at first and so did tim uh, my co-founder but one of our engineers insisted that like hey i can see user demand for this in the repo i'm confident this is going to work it's going to increase the number of active users that we have um we said well like we're big on autonomy we mean it like go build it and validate your point and he just proved us wrong. Uh, he got it out and he spent just two weeks, um, built it into kind of a basic state, launched it into the product, um, and then has kind of been refactoring. So we'll tend to kind of launch stuff very quickly first, um, but usually the engineer who built it will then uh, incorporate like you know, more testing, better scalability. We found PostHog as we looked across the analytics space, uh, we were hearing amazing things about this company that no one had sort of heard of, um, but customers had heard of them. What, what kind of customer feedback do you get? So working on open source for me has kind of made me re-fall in love with the internet. Like I can remember the first day I ever used it um, kind of at home and working in this way has given me that sense again. We just have this kind of user base that's growing really big by itself. With open source stuff, like if it doesn't quite meet your use case or it needs something extra, people will just raise a pull request. Um, people will just give you some code to make it better or they'll tell you really directly, hey, this is the thing I need. Um, we've got a huge amount of very precise feedback from users, like probably five to 10 times a day, and um, we get something from our users. That's enabled us to build something useful. How do you think about maintaining the culture of the company as you're going to need to hire, you know, call it 20 people, many of whom will be key execs? You know, how, how do you think about kind of where the culture of PostHog goes from here? As we get larger, it gets more and more tempting to put loads of process over the top of everyone um, to kind of take control when it's, you know, when you're five people, it's super easy to know kind of what's going on and what you're working on. We're now kind of 11, soon to be 12. Um, but yeah, by the time it gets to like 20 people or 30, um, I think it will kind of default into chaos. The way we're con mitigating this, though, is not through process. It's through um, pushing autonomy as far as we can um, and also pushing the quality of the people we're bringing in. We started, we've also put in a few little rituals, like uh, we ran a like, virtual dinner with every single employee, for example, where there were like, at the time, nine of us around the table. Every single one of those people gave every single one of the other people 75% like very direct feedback. And we just saw like a complete sea change really in the quality of feedback with people pushing each other. And, and, and maybe talk more about that. Uh, on the notion of transparency, I think there's a, a couple of companies, even in our, in, in our portfolio, who value transparency. Uh, how, how do you guys think about that? If you want something to be done to a better standard, if you're putting it publicly on the internet, it's probably going to make you up your game. So there's a touch of that when you're moving really quickly early on that, hey, actually, if we write down our policies, this matters so much to us that we kind of know that we'll just feel more accountable if other people are able to read them. I remember our first call, you're like, hey, like I've kind of done my due diligence because I can just see how the company's being run before I've been spoken to you. We've seen that from a hiring perspective too. We think it's much more inclusive um, because you can kind of see how a company operates um, before you join or talk to us. We put almost everything we can into the public. Um, and it's kind of amazing what starts happening when you take this approach. It's things like you'll uh, start thinking through a new policy or a way of working. Uh, you'll put it out, you'll say, hey, this is like a work in progress. I've nearly updated this page. And then literally sometimes in the morning you'll wake up and then some random person on the internet has like fixed your policy for you. So. Uh, we're starting to see that kind of thing happen all of the time. And it's just really kind of encouraging to kind of know that the world's watching. So, so uh, you know, be, being a company who came through Y Combinator, uh, I, I imagine there's a bunch of founders out there who would love to hear from you in terms of advice. What, what, what's the, you know, two or three pieces of advice that you would give a founder, Y Combinator or not, you know, but just someone who wants to start a company? Uh, you know, what have you learned in the last year that might be poignant? For companies like that so the top one i would give without doubt is uh work on really short time scales some founders seem to have magic where they're able to just spend like a year but like kind of working quietly away on something and launching it it's immediately popular they're not kind of people that I understand for us we just set very large weekly goals that we held ourselves accountable to and we kind of worked on a week as our sort of time frame for what we wanted to get something big done on and that was pretty significant, as in we need to go from idea to we have the first version of Postal working a week later, and we've spoken to 20 potential customers. And at the end of the week, we just say, hey, did we get that done or not? Like, what are we doing? Like, what did we learn from this process? And what are you doing for the next week? Um, I think the second bit for a Y Combinator, like it has a reputation as an accelerator for being like super hard to get into. And you kind of think everyone there's founded a company before and sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars. They just haven't. Um, there are some people like that, but most people there were just um, 
super smart, super quick, super articulate, um, super bright people. And like, we just filled out the form, <laughs> did the, followed the instructions, um, got in, had a, a great time. It was like, uh, I think it was the best possible start that we could have had. I, I think a lot of founders want to find a technical, you know, CTO co-founder. Talk to me about how you found Tim. Sure. So Tim and I spent a long time working together. That was very important to me. Like you're kind of, you're getting into this uh, very much like a marriage um, <laughs> where we're like stuck together for a long time. Uh, so I think having done real work before is something that I greatly valued. I was lucky that I've worked with a lot of engineers. The reason why I kind of wanted to work with Tim specifically is he's just the best engineer I've ever met. Um, he was unbelievably quick was the thing that stood out to me. And I felt that's the thing we're going to need here to um, become a huge company. That is the only advantage you have when you're really small. You're competing against you know, companies who are much later stage. How, how, how do you think about having a broad platform, but also having functionality to compete against companies that are ahead of you? Sure. So I think breadth is one of the key axes that we're going to, I think it's the root of us being able to build something that's fundamentally better product-wise. One of the things we kind of noticed is in the kind of fang tech companies, they've built this, a lot of proprietary software that kind of integrates all these traditionally separated out products. We're going further with this. We've recently released plugins into beta mode. What these enable us to do is we have an unfair advantage in that we have a big engineering audience and a huge kind of technical user base. They're making it, they're reducing the barrier to contribution to the platform. So if people want to get their product usage data into their CRM, for example, it's it's incredibly trivial to get data out or if you want to import data to postdoc from somewhere else. So we're starting to lean into this kind of breadth approach in the short run. In the long term, the integration points between these is how we'll build something that's more powerful. That is then things like when we deploy a change, we want to connect to GitHub as a check to you know tag our product metrics and so on. But for now, we're focused on the kind of 50 or 60% of features that provide 95% of the value. On the personal side, I believe you just had a baby. But also, you know, sure. how in the world do you manage uh, to have a new family and also a new startup at the same time? Tell me about that. So, yeah, we've got a 22-week-old daughter called Ruby. Um, I think she was born probably about two days before we closed the round or something like that. So, um, yeah, I was worried it was going to be a little, I was going to, I was going to get too much sleep, clearly. We, um, I guess, kind of having uh, young children is like the ultimate constraint on your time. It's kind of almost a forcing thing. Like similarly, actually, to if you're really scaled, like if we had 200 people working here, I'm just not going to have time to spend with all of them individually. So you have to start thinking about systems and the way the company kind of operates. So I think it's forced us to take a slightly... Uh, for me personally, I think it's forced me to take a slightly more scalar approach to things a little bit earlier than I otherwise would have. Sometimes the constraint it has in your time kind of forces you to innovate your way out of it to work out how to be more efficient, which you were going to have to do anyway at some stage. So it just sort of brings forward a couple of bits and pieces like that. 